Welcome back, you guys. This is Tennyson Eastead, writer and director of Quantum Theory. I'm here with Eleanor Gunn, who's playing the part of Roe, and Gerard Marzilli, who's playing the part of Lee. We are some of the eight-sided players. <laughs> and, um, and thank you for joining us on this eight-sided blog. So I'm turning the camera on right now because we're actually in the middle of a heated discussion about sexual politics in Hollywood. Heated. Obviously, um, and, and also race politics in Hollywood. And unsurprisingly, this all got started with the, the release of Harvey Weinstein's behavior over the last 50 years. Um, 50 years. How about, I mean, he's got to be 70, right? Maybe we're, no, when did he no, start Air Max? Yeah, the, in, the, in the 80s. In the, well, in the early 80s, he was his, his first film was Harvey, the Weinstein Company's first film was uh, The Burning, a fantastic little slasher film from the 80s, which starred Jason Alexander when he had hair, and uh, <coughs> and effects by Tom Savini. Um, but yeah, that, and that was in 1981. Okay. So 36 years ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, who wants to start this ball rolling? I, you know, my, my experience with with the power gaps in Hollywood is related entirely to being disabled, um, mm -hmm. and it's and it's definitely, it's definitely, it's not the same experiences that Eleanor's had. I like I have experienced sexual assault since being disabled, which is not something I ever thought. I just it was, never thought it would happen. Oh my god! And and um, and it happened at the workplace with someone that I still work with every day. Oh my goodness. And uh, my saving grace in that situation is that although I am obviously very visibly a cripple, I'm also very good at expressing myself and I'm keeping that situation contained through frankly the threat of violence. Like that's, I have the ability to turn that around. You know what I'm saying? And flip that situation. That person cannot overpower me. They just thought it was their right. Hmm. Um, and to be candid, it was their right. That's the problem. Why was it yeah. their right? Because the system is built to reinforce the power relationships that we have. At the end of the day, until the system is built not to reinforce those power relationships, then somebody isn't wrong for thinking it's their right to violate someone else's privacy on some kind of factual level. They're just wrong ethically. They're just, they're just not helping build a better world. But they are, I think, present in the system that we have working today. They're paying attention. These cops that are shooting these black people no, they're going to get away with it. They know that the judge is going to have their back. They know that the other cops are going to have their back. They know the system is built to make sure that they get presented with the best possible circumstances in court, and then they're all acquitted. There's no fear of consequence. So they are making decisions about whether or not to kill these black kids with all of that information in their heads. That's not the same circumstance you're going to face if you shoot a white lady in a convenience store and they know it. Whether or not they've sat down and made a little flow chart about it is irrelevant. It's almost sub subconscious. It's totally like, subconscious. Because, because the power relationships are so uh, yeah. ingrained. And you know, yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, all of us have experienced you know, something like that. I mean, I, I probably obviously experience it a lot less than like you, know, you do or you do, you know, but, um, but you know, I, I have been a young, very pretty 25-year-old like actor and like, and like, yeah, you know, I've had people, you know, literally say like, well, if you play your cards right, then maybe I'll get this part, you know, <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and in a threatening way, not in a like, ha ha, kidding, kidding, but like, in, in like, I'm like, oh, and then keep doing it, and then keep doing it, and then keep doing it. Mm. And uh, I'm an old enough theater hand that I've seen this type of behavior since I was little, and I know I'm streetwise enough about it to be like, fuck off, <laughs> you know, like, but, but it's, it's harder when you're younger and you see you're in a whole new place, you're in this place called Hollywood Land, where there's lots of power, there are people controlling the gates, you know, and, uh, of, of power, and you're like, I know maybe, I certainly felt that way with my previous story, which yeah. was that I assumed that I needed to stay with this person in order to have them say nice things about me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want them to say anything negative against me if I chose not to be with them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and you think that, you know, when you're young, 
uh, you start to think like, well, if I just do it this one time or this time or three times, or, or, or you start to get cynical and you're like, right. maybe this is just how the game is played. It's like the Godfather, right. this is the life we have chosen, you know? Right. And you start thinking like, well, I compromise, but, but in the end, it's all going to be worth it. You know, like, and, you know, like if I sleep with this person, it's all going to be worth it. But you're also surrounded right. by a system of judgments and assumptions that reinforce those kinds of behaviors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Depending on, there's, there's, there's two... There's two sides to show business, you know, and there's two sides to Hollywood. But specifically, you know, as an example, when it comes to my brain injury, yes, I've encountered a lot of problems out there in the world, but it's been my show people who have been prepared to be the most supportive because we have the show. You know what I'm saying? So my DP, actors like Gerard and Dan and America and all the other people who are kind of in our circle have been the people who have said okay what is it going to take to get this done and that done and that done and then even to the point where like there's been some really gross stuff with this injury mm -hmm. like nasty ass old person gross shit like yeah. Yeah. and those are the people who fucking worked through it mm -hmm. you know and and i was raised in repertory theater where those kinds of behaviors are expected we expect one another to be there for each other and we expect one another to respect each other's craft above and beyond anything else and, and so on the one hand, I believe that there's an inherent trend towards that. And on the other hand, we have so much greed in Hollywood and so many people trying to exploit one another. And I, I get confused because I meet, what, what drives me crazy is when I meet people who are supposed to be show people who aren't. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not confused when, it, when an agent or a manager who graduated from business school and came here to find a way to exploit actors gets sucked into the addiction of power and starts exploiting people because I'm like, that's what you came here for anyway. You just are way more of a shithead than is legal. Like, that's what's happening. Whereas, you know, an actor who s started working when they were 13 and has been working, you know, nonstop and working to help build these theater companies, when somebody like that winds up becoming guilty of exploitation like this, it, fucking blows my mind every time because I'm like, how the fuck do you not know better? You know, reading this, not to say one way or the other what the situation is, but reading the uh, open letter from Joss Whedon's wife was fucking mind-blowing for me. I was read like, it. holy fuck. Well, the, the content of the letter is that he's had a number of different indiscretions over the course of their relationship. Oh, really? And that it was always with fans and then hmm. Mr. Whedon's response was that um, he's surrounded by all these needy, impulsive, geeky women, and and how is he supposed to? I mean, how is he supposed to have accountability? <laughs> is the subtext of the? How am I not supposed to put my penis inside all of these? Women? <laughs> I don't even know if they want me, but they want something that I have. And to me, it's like Jesus fucking Christ. That's your audience. Yeah. Like what the. Fuck are you doing? That's your audience. Like it's like sleeping with your children. It's, it's like, like sleeping with your children. Yeah. And that's not you're to say for them. Yes. Uh, you are responsible for your audience and you're responsible for your community. And show personship for me is about knowing that and acting on it and cultivating and it. And I've I've had people like, I've had people say, Well, wouldn't while arguing about this, well, wouldn't you do that? I mean rock stars do it all the time. Wouldn't you wouldn't you do that? I'm like, no. I don't I mean like Maybe if somebody, I mean, if somebody enjoys my work, you know, I've, I've dated people who have enjoyed my work, obviously, and like, and it's good that they enjoy my work, but it's not like, I'm not going to take advantage of them because, because they enjoy my work. I, well, I think, okay, yeah. like, I, my body of work is not substantial enough for anybody to know anything that I've done or be a quote-unquote fan. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. I'm the smallest, tiniest tadpole on this, in this huge pond. So, when and if you become celebrity mm -hmm. on any real level, I think that that is something, whether you want it or not, that's something that just kind of, it seems like, clings to you, yeah. clings to you and happens to you, <laughs> and you're not necessarily ready for it when it happens. And the people who are here, a lot of the time, have traumatic problems and are not necessarily the best people to be shedding themselves and putting on a character and then delving deep into these emotional uh, places when they're not, they've never been to therapy, they don't know who they are.
are, and then they put on all of these different personas, and then people like those things about them. But that's not who they really are. I mean, that's what Lady Gaga, five foot two, that um, uh, documentary that's on Netflix right oh, now. I just saw that. that. Is it wicked good? It's so brilliant. But it, she's saying <laughs> that. I mean, you see somebody who has all of these things kind of thrust upon them, and then. You have no idea how you're going to react in that situation when that many people want something from you and then you yourself have so little to give at that point because you're a commodity. You're now this thing that people prop up and parade in front of everybody as in like, look how well Lady Gaga is doing, look how poorly Lady Gaga is doing. When I mean, I, I actually then felt guilty for something where I was like, I don't really know if I liked her her last music video. I thought it was kind of weird mm -hmm. and not very good. And then I was like, who the hell am I to tell this person? Not, I'm not telling her to her face. And that's probably the reason why I can say it. But I'm having this opinion about someone who I don't know. And she put in so much of herself to that piece of work. And I then decided to judge it simply because I was like, well, you put it out here so I can judge it. Yeah. You start it's thinking like, about it yourself when you get a bad, re like, like like a shitty review that's just like that's exactly completely right. kind of like, or at least you feel is unjustified. And and but it's on the tiniest microcosm of a scale yeah. versus Lady Gaga, Gaga who Gaga, is a yeah. she's a, star. Not, not even she's an icon yeah. at this point now. So yeah. you have my the only tiny, icon in the last twenty years, I might add, in that agreed. field. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, I mean that whole. Madonna kind of passing the torch to this person and unwillingly passing the torch. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, in my, in this tiny little black box theater in the heart of Hollywood, you know, renowned, um, but, <laughs> but tiny. Um, and then I get a review from someone, I've been thinking about that because my show's going to open here soon, and we have a press night on the 18th, and if the 18th doesn't go well, what are they going to say? And I've been having a struggle just getting into the character because it's such a cerebral play that I'm trying to find this emotional connectivity to it and it's been proving a little bit more difficult as I'm growing as an actor, it keeps getting harder and harder to act um, because I don't know, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing and I, I know nothing. So I'm worried that people are gonna come review my play, give me a shitty review and then I'm going to be judged accordingly and people are going to come see the show or not and think something that they've read. Not that they would read it yeah. because it's a tiny little podunk theater. But it worries me that we're putting so much emphasis on what people think about things. Like we can't go out and do anything without reading a Yelp review about You know what though? Or, you know, I, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I have some thoughts on this subject in particular. I'm sure you what, do. What, <laughs> Well, because I, because I, 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 after the brain injury, I had to take. I was, I was, I was going to have a stroke statistically. Jesus, yeah. So, um, I made a quick effort to write down everything I knew about show business for Gerard and my other actors. What time is it? Sorry. No worries. I made a, I made a, I made an effort to write down everything I knew about show business so that I didn't leave everybody hanging if I just up and died or was incapable of speech. And it's all on Facebook. It's called the developmental breakdown. I know. I read it. You read the whole thing. Where's I the did read the whole thing. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, so one of the things was why are we not curing cancer? Mm -hmm. Like, why is that not a thing that we're doing instead of all this? And what I came to understand is that the, the experiences that we choose to have in common are what makes communication worthwhile. Mm -hmm. We we assume things about each other and we transmit information to each other based on those assumptions and how strong we think the bridge can carry information. If you and I, if all we have in common is The Apprentice, I'm not gonna try and talk to you about quantum physics. I'm just not gonna do it. It's not worth it. It's unlikely that we will find a way to understand each other. Mm. But the fact that you and I have had all these experiences in common, that we've chosen to work in theater, that we've seen all this nerdy shit that we've seen, right. I can make that effort and trust that you're gonna be able to pick it up. The experiences we choose to have in common are our culture. That's what gives us that framework. Whether we have a religion in common, whether we have a, you know what I mean? Whether we have shows in common or books in common or whatever, whatever we have in common that we chose to do, mm -hmm. we can trust that at least we both did that thing. And so the quality of the experiences we choose to have together becomes very important mm -hmm. to the success of our civilization. 
you're not gonna cure cancer without Star Trek. You're not gonna fucking do it. Because I've managed laboratories. And laboratory people do not know how to talk. They don't. And it takes more than one person to run a genetics lab. So you need to find a way to get those people talking to each other. And newsflash, it's always Star Trek in a laboratory. That's always ground zero. It is for sure. Unless it's Babylon 5. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but yeah, having you're, like, you're saying that there's a... Putting people in a dark room and telling them to judge something is our job. Like That's a big part of what we do. And the fact that they're out there talking about the experience that they had in common mm -hmm. is very useful. The question is... Have we given them an experience to have in common that encourages a higher level of discourse and that challenges them to see each other in a more specific light? Mm -hmm. That's where our responsibility begins and ends. We can have other goals. Within the work that we do at 8 Sided Films, I want to inspire people, I want to challenge people, I want to delight people. That's what I like. Two out of three, because three is very messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, quantum theory is a, an inspire and challenge. Or an inspire and delight, I would say. It's not very challenging. Inspire and delight. Man and Machine is definitely inspiring challenge. <laughs> yeah, because it's inspiring. These people are trying to create this thing that's never been created. Yeah. It's like, wow, can people do that? And no. <laughs> it's not delightful, though. <laughs> it's not, there's no delight in that movie. Unless you're twisted. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> but, but putting people in the dark room and asking them to engage that experience and become more of a community as a result and to take the standard that that experience provides them with to heart and to engage each other on that level yeah. is awesome. It's awesome power. I agree. You know, that's, so I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a counter argument to do people have the right to leave the theater and just judge? Well, that's part of the conversation. I don't, I, I, it doesn't, I'm scared to death of it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're saying, I guess they do. Yeah, or, I guess. <laughs> or like, as long as it gets a conversation going, this purpose is served. Yeah. They had the experience together. Hopefully more people will have the experience together. Hopefully I did well, and hopefully I found the right audience mm -hmm. to engage what I did. And that's partly my responsibility, and it's partly theirs, and we can talk about where those boundaries are. Yeah. Well, that's why stories yeah. and art are, are essential to any human society. Yeah. You know, that's yep. how we stop killing each other and how we start talking to each other, mm -hmm. I guess, around the campfire. Well, we wound up in a completely different place than where we started. Yes. But I feel like that's the end of the blog. What do you guys think? Sure. All right. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Give us a thumbs up. <laughs> Give us a subscribe if you like these videos. I will let Lee figure out what to do with this mess that we have created. Signing off. <laughs>